now. It's time. Stand up and be serious here. Welcome. Uh, today, at Boston Global Forum, we kick up and start a series of Meet Boston Global Forum Leaders. And uh, today we have uh, the honor to introduce Professor Thomas Patterson. Uh, he is a professor in Kennedy School, Sorrentine Center on Press, Politics and Public Policy. And, uh, and so he co-founder at Boston Global Forum, board directors, Boston Global Forum. We yeah. are very, very honored to present to you Professor Tom Peterson. Yes. Tuan, thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to be here and to um, be the inaugural speaker on uh, this series that uh, Boston Global Forum is going to uh, be holding where we're looking at important books, important ideas. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, my book, Informing the News, uh, which came out uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, and it looks at journalism and how journalism can make uh, a larger contribution to, uh, to democracy. Uh, one of the things that's interesting to me about journalism uh, is that it needs a deeper, stronger knowledge base. Uh, this is not a new argument. This is an argument that uh, Walter Lippmann uh, raised uh, nearly a century ago in his classic book, Public Opinion. Uh, over the decades, many journalists have commented uh, on this deficiency. Uh, one of my favorite columnists, the New York Times, Tom Wicker, uh, talked about uh, a lack of subject matter expertise being one of the most severe weaknesses in journalism. And what he was talking about when he said that is that he was referring to journalists dependent on their sources. American journalists, uh, since late in the 19th century, uh, have depended heavily on interviews, press conferences, um, and other uh, means of gathering information of that kind. Uh, and they've used the words of policymakers uh, and important public figures uh, as the foundation for much of their news. Uh, in other words, they're borrowing uh, much of their knowledge. Um, and that's something fairly distinctive about journalism. Uh, in the United States, we think of journalism as a profession in the same way as law and medicine, economics. Um, uh, but it's different. Uh, if you think about medicine, uh, what informs the doctor's judgment? Uh, medical science. If you think about law, what informs the lawyer's judgment? A body of law. If you're an economist, what informs your judgment? Well, macroeconomic theory, microeconomic theory. Uh, what is it about journalists? What's their body of knowledge? Um, and the answer is, for by and large, there is no such thing uh, as a knowledge of journalism in the same sense as the others. What journalists are taught to do, and what they're very skilled at, and it's not a small skill, uh, they're taught to be able to gather information, uh, put it together in a story, and communicate it uh, effectively to the public. Um, but the knowledge component, for the most part, is borrowed knowledge. Uh, and I think one of the best examples of that uh, was during the first Persian Gulf War uh, that the United States was involved in. Uh, when reporters showed up at the Pentagon press office, um, hanging over the door, the entry to the Pentagon press office, was a sign that said, temporary war experts. Uh, meaning that the real experts were in the Pentagon and the journalists were there uh, and would act as experts, but they really didn't know what they were covering. Uh, so that's the long-standing tradition in American journalism, heavily dependent on sources and what sources know. Uh, but I think there's a knowledge deficiency that underlies that dependence, uh, and I think there's a new urgency uh, to the problem. One part, and one reason it's more urgent, uh, is that we have more spin in politics than we've ever had. Uh, we have more public relations behind com public communication today than ever. Uh, and certainly many of the messages uh, that are put out by these sources are, are accurate, uh, but oftentimes uh, they're half-truths, part-truths, sometimes untruths, outright lies. Uh, and the journalist has to be able to deal with that information from a position of strength. And what gives you strength when you're trying to look at information and trying to judge uh, its accuracy, its relevance, is that you know something about the subject. 
so that you can test it against what you know. The second reason why I think that journalists have to know more uh, to meet the needs of, of democracy today is that public policy is enormously more complicated today than it even was a few decades ago. Uh, the most recent example, of course, is the rollout of the health care plan and, uh, and basically how that didn't work. And, you know, this is, a, this is a piece of legislation and a program that has so many angles to it uh, that it's really difficult to report effectively on it. Uh, if you don't have some understanding of it. Um, and there are many areas in which there's a true knowledge deficiency in, in journalism. Uh, if you look at economic coverage, for example, uh, what gets reported in the news? We, we get a lot of news about Wall Street. Uh, we get a lot of news about the stock market. We get a lot of news about new IPOs. So Twitter does an IPO, and it's all over the front pages. Uh, but outside of that circle, we don't get very much coverage. And that means a public that is kind of thinking about the economy through that particular lens. But when you look at the actual economy, what you see is that two-thirds of American jobs do not come from big business. They come from small business. Uh, and yet you'd be hard-pressed to find more than a handful of journalists who really understand small business enough to report on it accurately. And even more than that, to think about uh, the kind of uh, subjects, the parts of, of small business that need uh, to be illuminated so that the American public understands that sector and understands its role in the health of that uh, part of our economy. Now, in addition to that, I think there's a third reason we need better journalism, uh, and it's because of what else is happening in our media system. Uh, if you look back about 30 or 40 years ago, we had a fairly simple media system, what some scholars call a low-choice system. You know, for most Americans, it was a choice between ABC, NBC, CBS News. It was a choice between the local paper and no paper. In most communities, there was only a local paper. But if you look at the situation today, uh, there are literally dozens and dozens of information sources available to us. Broadcast uh, television, broadcast radio, cable television, uh, talk shows uh, on radio and on television, uh, the Internet. Uh, just hundreds upon hundreds of sources of information available to us. The difficulty is, is that many of these sources uh, aren't trying to inform us. Uh, they're trying to attract us, certainly. They're trying to make us part of their audience. But oftentimes they do that uh, through outrage uh, and through half-truths and the like. And I think when you look at talk shows, uh, you do see, you know, that... Um, you know, that's a real problem. Uh, and what we need in the system uh, is a source of information that we can rely on, that will give us relevant information, trustworthy information on the news of the day. And if you look around, there's only one institution in the media system uh, that's positioned to do that, that has the resources, the norms, uh, the tradition, uh, and that's uh, the news media and the journalists who work within the, within the news media. The difficulty is, is that increasingly we're not getting from the news media what we expect from them. Uh, we're getting a lot of infotainment. Uh, celebrity is a much larger part of our news than it was in the past. Uh, and, uh, and then we're getting a lot of uh, other things that are more in the sense of trying to attract our attention as opposed to essentially making our attention worthwhile, teaching us something about what's happening in the world. So what would it take? Uh, to change journalism in the direction that I'm talking about. Well, one thing I think our newsrooms have to change. Uh, they need to be stocked with people who not only are good at telling stories, but who understand the subject matter of the stories they're telling. And we see some trend in this direction in many of America's newsrooms. Increasingly, you'll find economists or lawyers, even physicians, uh, in newsrooms, and they're reporting on the things that they know well about. But when you look across the whole of the news system, they still account for less than 5% of working journalists. So I think newsrooms have to embed more, more knowledge in, in, uh, uh, and, and more capacity in that direction uh, in their organizations. But I think fundamentally where change has to occur, because this really gives you some possibilities for the future, is the way that uh, journalism education in the United States is conducted. 
Traditionally, if you go to journalism school, you don't study a body of knowledge. You learn to do stories. Uh, and this is a difficult skill to acquire, so it's understandable why you have to teach people how to uh, produce stories. Uh, but, and you're taught tools, usually two tools. Uh, you're taught how to conduct interviews, and you're taught how to do observation. So if something happens in the vicinity, you go out, you observe, you try to gather information at the scene, and then you put those things together uh, in a news story. Um, but we think journalists need to know more than that. They need a third tool, and that tool is knowledge. Um, and we had a six-year project, and when I say we, I'm talking about uh, my center at uh, the Kennedy School of Government in, 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 uh, at Harvard. We did a project with the Carnegie and Knight Foundations where we worked with 11 of America's top journalism schools to try to figure out how it is in their training we can get students to apply knowledge to their reporting in situations just as they now, so almost by, by second nature, apply the interview technique the observation technique. And what we discovered in the course of those six years, many different pilots, many different ways of approaching that, is that you can uh, instruct journalism students in this way. But even more, uh, the product, what they produce, is much richer, much deeper. Uh, it's also much wider uh, in the sense that when journalists and journalism students have an understanding of a subject area, they see it in a larger way. Uh, than if it's something that they know very little about. They'll see parts of it that they want to expose, bring to the public's attention. Well, if you're not even familiar, not even aware that there is such a part, it's going to stay in the shadows. And that's why we've got to move journalism education, journalism practice, more fully toward knowledge so that we can broaden, deepen, improve, uh, strengthening our journalism in terms of its relevance and its information value. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tom Peterson. You're the first professor uh, joy and uh, give talk on a uh, series Boston Global Forum. Uh, meet Boston Global Forum leaders. That should, uh, this tie also very exciting tie that I celebrate for uh, Boston Global Forum birthday, birthday December 12th. So uh, we, are, we have many, many questions and from uh, audience uh, sent here now. And Jonah, please send question to yep. Professor Tom Peterson. Thank you for giving us uh, the privilege to have you as the first speaker. <coughs> oh, um, thank you. So I guess the uh, first question that would make sense to start off, given that, that uh, we are at the Boston Global Forum, uh, and we have had some people ask us uh, how you came about to be involved in the Boston Global Forum and to provide some background information about that side of your involvement? Well, um, this idea really started with uh, Tuan and myself, and uh, probably more with Tuan than, than with me. But, uh, you know, we were talking about all the possibilities uh, that exist in this, in this city. Uh, and uh, it's sometimes called the Athens of America, uh, a reference to all of the colleges and universities that are here. Uh, we have something on the order of 40 colleges and universities within the, um, uh, within the Boston metropolitan area. Uh, each year, uh, 300,000 or more students come to this area. Uh, and we've got great institutions here. Uh, but what is lacking in some ways is a central place, a place where you can go uh, and experience the full richness of the community not just what Harvard has to offer, or MIT, or Northeastern, or Tufts, or Boston University, or Boston College, or uh, going out uh, a little bit to the West, Wellesley and the others, uh, Brandeis and so on. Um, but how do we think about uh, bringing to the world uh, uh, the many intellectual riches that are here, uh, the voices uh, that can help them to think through many of the public issues? Uh, and that was the genesis. Uh, that was the origins of the Boston Global Forum. But in thinking about it uh, and in truly making it global, uh, we don't want it simply to be about Boston voices. We want it to be about the globe's voices. Uh, so it's going to originate from here. It's going to expand from here. Uh, this is our home, and it was the natural place uh, to start making it happen. Uh, but we truly intend to, uh, to make it a place where people around the world can come. Uh, 
and listen to discussions of important issues, find out about what uh, uh, governments are doing about those issues, uh, what people can do uh, to make good things happen uh, in their world. So uh, that's kind of how it started, and that's kind of our general vision uh, of what Boston Global Forum can be. So given that we aim to look for practical solutions to, to real-world issues, and, and your extensive background and expertise in, in journalism and politics, um, how, how do you see the, the field of journalism having an impact and contributing to the issue that we're working towards solving this year of minimal standards for workers' safety? Well, I, th I think, uh, sadly, I think um, that particular issue exposes uh, part of the problem of journalism. Um, so when do workers uh, end up on the front page of our newspapers or at the top of our newscasts? Uh, Almost always, it takes a disaster uh, for them to be at the top of the of, of the news. Uh, that was certainly the case with the tragedy around a plaza in Bangladesh. Uh, now, that's a, important that that kind of those events and developments get covered uh, because it brings them to our attention, makes us want to do something about it. Uh, but the other dimensions of of uh, uh, of workers' lives are pretty much neglected. Uh, you, know, you can look around a lot of newsrooms and you don't even see a labor correspondent uh, in the mix. Uh, there's always a business reporter, usually more than one. Uh, a labor reporter? Usually not. Uh, so that, um, you know, I think uh, this particular issue in some ways uh, really exposes uh, some of the problems uh, that we have in terms of journalism. Uh, we don't have enough reporters who know enough about labor uh, to bring that issue to us in a full way. Um, and, uh, you know, if we did have more reporters of that kind, we probably would have had stories before Rana Plaza about the problems uh, that were facing uh, workers in that particular industry, the unsafe conditions under which they operate, uh, the low wage conditions under which they operate. Uh, and basically, uh, we might have had some, uh, in, at an earlier time, we might have had more momentum toward doing something about this problem. Thank you. Um, we have a question from, from a student in the Boston area that, that ties in very well with, with what you just said. And, and that is, why do you think that, I mean, the, the, there is news that is, like, like you said, the business gets a lot of coverage, but that is not in the interest of, of the average citizen. And how come that there is this imbalance uh, between news that is in the interest of the average citizen uh, versus news that, uh, like the Twitter IPO, that, that has just no relation to, to anyone, to the average citizen's life? Well, I think journalists are, are probably like the rest of us. Uh, to some degree, they cover the things that interest them. Uh, and then they do the things that they're accustomed to doing. Uh, so, for example, if you look at Washington, um, you can go to the White House um, any day of the week, and there will be several hundred journalists in the vicinity. And you know, if there's a presidential press conference, they'll the room will be full. Uh, and sometimes the president won't even be in Washington. The president might be elsewhere. And there are days, even in the presidency, that are a bit slow. There may be nothing meaningful. Uh, that's going on. But uh, that's a tradition. Uh, and of course, for television journalists, it means standing outside the White House uh, in the evening and, and doing a stand-up, uh, talking about what happened inside as you're standing outside, as if that gave it more weight, gave it more authority. Uh, that, to me, uh, is a kind of journalism that is unreflective. Uh, that's a kind of journalism uh, that is simply built on routines uh, it's designed around beats. Uh, well, we need our journalists who kind of look more broadly at the world, get out of Washington, get out of New York, uh, and uh, make the news more about ordinary people and our problems. Uh, you know, news ought not to be just about politicians and their problems or corporate execs and their problems. You know, fundamentally, democracy is about people and their problems. We need, need more news of that kind. Uh, Journalists need to be trained uh, to do that. They need to think in that broader lens uh, about their reporting. Uh, now, that takes time. Uh, you have to undo a lot of practices, a lot of traditions, 
that are deeply embedded uh, in the news process to do that. But I think it's doable over time. Do you do you know of any uh, media outlets that are sort of going in, in that direction of, of uh, broadcasting and making available news that is explicitly framed in the interest of the average citizen? Well, I think, I think there are some news outlets that do more of it than others. Um, you know, I think, for example, if you were to compare broadcasting outlets, uh, I think you would find that uh, National Public Radio, NPR, uh, does more stories about ordinary people uh, and what they're doing, what their lives are like, what their problems are, what their successes are, uh, the opportunities uh, that they face, the challenges that they face. I think NPR has a lot more of that uh, than the other uh, than the other network. So, you know, I think it is doing. Uh, you know, it still has a lot of. It's, it's still a little bit top heavy. It's still kind of centered around the power centers. That's uh, that's the tradition in American journalism. But there's a good model there uh, that you can also cover ordinary people uh, while at the same time you're covering the powerful. Mm -hmm. um, one, one of the the. The ideas or, or practices that has been gaining a lot of traction in, in the last years is the idea of crowdfunding. Uh, do you think there, there might be a future for a, a media platform that sort of comes from the bottom up from, from a, a large public interest in, in funding a platform that uh, is geared towards informing uh, news that is in their interest and that is relevant to them? Well, I think sadly, um, those models don't work in the long run. They can they can work in the short run, uh, but they tend not to work in the in the long run. Uh, the most successful uh, case that we have, of course, is is again national public radio. But if you look at the national public radio audience, the NPR audience, uh, it's a quite large audience, uh, somewhat on the order of twenty twenty five million uh, listeners a week. Uh, now. How many of those listeners contribute to National Public Radio? How many are willing, essentially, to part with their money for the news that they get from NPR? Well, it's about 10%. In other words, the other 90% are free riding. They're using the service, but they're not paying for it. Uh, the way that uh, we ordinarily pay for news in America is indirectly. Uh, we have to sit through the advertising. Uh, in order to get through the news. Uh, now that model works. That's a time-tested model. Uh, I think the other models, uh, voluntary contributions, expecting foundations somehow to come through. You know, foundations will fund interesting media ventures. Uh, they'll fund important possibilities, uh, but they're not going to fund them indefinitely. So they might do a startup and give it the money to go for the first two or three years if it's trying to do news in a new and interesting and important way. Uh, but it's not going to guarantee uh, uh, that that uh, organization is going to get funding year after year. The places where you do have public funding uh, of media are those places where basically it's a tax on the citizen. So, you know, the BBC, how does it get most of its money? Uh, well, it gets its most of its money because you can't have a television set in Britain you know, without paying the fee that goes to the BBC. So, uh, but that, every television set owner uh, has to pay that. Uh, that's different than, than a voluntary model. And sadly, I don't think um, there's a long future in the voluntary way of, the voluntary model of, of funding news. Thank you. And so you, you just mentioned the, the BBC. Uh, have, you, have you looked at uh, international, other countries, uh, systems uh, and and have you found some differences with it with the US uh, or some ideas like you just mentioned with the BBC that gets a lot of public funding that that might be able to be introduced to the United States or reintroduced well there's certainly a lot of different ways of doing news and if you look across the world um, you know every news system has has some special features but there are some commonalities uh, by and large, the news is about current events, uh, unless you're in a one-party state where the where the government controls what you see. But you know, if there's a degree of freedom in the news system, uh, the news is mostly about what's happening today and what happened yesterday. So that's a common feature. Uh, but then across news systems, you do see some differences, and they come out of different traditions. So in the American tradition, uh, the news has been fundamentally commercial, uh, supported by advertising. Uh, in some of the European systems, you have a deeper tradition 
of, of public news uh, through public broadcasting. That makes a difference. Uh, the, uh, if you're trying to meet the demands of a commercial market, you produce the product somewhat differently than if basically you're in the public information business and you don't have to worry so much about attracting audiences uh, in, in a competitive environment. And then you find differences in traditions. Uh, so the American tradition of observation, of interviewing, that, that journalism tradition that I talked about in my opening comments, uh, the interviewing tradition started in the United States. It was invented here. Uh, now, it's used also in Europe, but it's used less extensively. And in a country like Germany, uh, there's much more of a tradition for journalists to kind of dig more deeply into the story, to apply knowledge to the story, not to the depth that I'm talking about uh, in terms of changing journalism in a fundamental way, but that's a deeper part of the news there. Uh, you look at Sweden, they do it differently. They, uh, they in some ways kind of have a social mission around their news in terms of getting to the various groups in society and have them represented in the news. And then in the British system, in addition to the BBC, you find some of the best newspapers in the world and, and then some of the worst ones. I mean, it, they have both, the, both the, a very high quality press and a, and a, and, and a very down market or, or, or tabloid press. So there's a lot of variation uh, from places to places. And I think every new system can learn some lessons from each uh, every other new system. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it comes down to me, to the training of the reporters, and the resources that the reporters are given uh, to go after the stories and to tell them fully and accurately. Um, I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier about uh, foundations that they, they're willing to, to fund uh, new media ventures often. So uh, Pierre Media, the, the founder of eBay, recently just uh, announced that he would invest $250 million uh, to launch a for-profit media venture with, with Glenn Greenwald. How, how do you see this, this model sort of uh, launched by philanthropy where one person with an incredible amount of, of uh, economic power decides to, to launch a new media outlet? Well, I, I think there are going to be more of these. Um, you know, you might even put Al Jazeera in that category. Uh, you probably could now put the Washington Post in that category. It was... Uh, purchased recently by um, someone of extraordinary wealth. Uh, but in the United States, we've got 1,500, 1,600 daily newspapers. Uh, we've got uh, that number of, of local television affiliates. Uh, and uh, the very rich are not going to bail out all of those. Uh, I think what you'll see is the very rich looking for uh, opportunities. Uh, the Washington Post is an important brand, and brand is important in the news industry, uh, second to the New York Times uh, and the Wall Street Journal, it probably is the top newspaper brand in the United States. That, that can be attractive to someone who's very wealthy. Uh, I think in terms of uh, Greenwald and, and that possibility, uh, I think there was an idea there that a certain kind type of journalism, if funded well, could really shed light on things that are not uh, being illuminated, and, and that was a very attractive uh, in that case, and of course, uh, in the case of Al Jazeera, uh, it was an attempt, and an important attempt, uh, and to some degree, and in some parts of the world, very successful in bringing uh, part of the story being untold about uh, the Middle East uh, to the public's attention. So I think there will be those kinds of opportunities, and there will be some interest on the part of the very wealthy uh, to, to jump into those places. but it's not going to solve the problem of the media system writ large. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the, the next couple of questions come from a journalist, Tom Murphy. He's based in the Boston area. Yeah. He uh, works on international development and right. humanitarian issues. And his first question is, uh, what are your thoughts on the balance between simplicity and complexity in international reporting? Well, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I, and I think it's really hard. I mean, uh, one of the hardest areas to report in, and I'm talking in terms of the marketplace, uh, is, uh, you know, foreign or international reporting. Uh, Americans don't have very much appetite for it, uh, and therefore editors and publishers don't have a lot of appetite for it. And so I think there are a lot of compromises that are forced uh, on the journalist in that situation. But to me, you know, nearly every era of public policy has extraordinary complexity. And the way that 
journalists can think about trying to deal with that. Uh, and you've got an audience, of course, that you've got to you've got to get their attention. Uh, and they don't study the news; they follow the news. So there's a need for simplification uh, in the coverage. But the simplification occurs to me in the story. The simplification does not occur across the range of stories that are used to cover a particular area of our public life. And there you build complexity in by bringing in dimensions that need to be seen but are rarely seen. So that, again, it, you know, much of the international coverage is all about crises and war and the like. And in some ways that's the way the newsrooms tend to look at what uh, the audience can be uh, interested in. I mean, if you look at the coverage of Africa, it's almost entirely uh, negative. Uh, so it's about things like AIDS and it's about uh, the wars that are going on there. We don't get the good stories uh, coming out of Africa. Uh, that's a different kind of simplification than simplification in the context of a story. That's the simplification of the, of the large picture of Africa. And to me, that's the larger problem in journalism. Yeah, thank you. Tom's second question is, uh, given the journalism industry's trend, what do you think media outlets, why do you think media outlets would publish more knowledge-based reporting? Well, I think to some degree uh, there's not strong evidence that they would. Um, but I think we have pretty strong evidence now that uh, weak reporting is bad for business. Uh, there have been a number of studies, one by the Project for Excellence in Journalism, uh, and uh, that shows that weak reporting is very costly to the news industry. Uh, infotainment is costly in the long run, not the short run, to the news industry. That if you degrade the product, uh, at some point people are going to start looking for alternatives. And uh, according to some studies, uh, as many as a third of Americans uh, have left a source that they trusted and found other sources uh, because they simply thought the news had lost uh, lost its integrity, had lost its value. Um, now, what we see on the web is we do see more direct evidence that uh, that you might possibly have a pretty good market for uh, for the kind of news that I'm talking about. Two things do well on the on the web. Uh, one is the short update, the quick update. Uh, and if I could use a sports analogy, you know, if, uh, if we're not near the television set uh, and our favorite NFL team is playing, we probably try to update ourselves as frequently as we can during the course of the of the game. There's a real there's a real market uh, for that kind of information. Uh, I don't think that can be the future of journalism, however, because a lot of that kind of information is also within the means of ordinary citizens, and you're going to find other outlets that are going to be providing that, and in fact, oftentimes uh, uh, when there's a sports game going on, it's our friends who are updating us. Uh, we don't need the journalists to do that. Uh, where we need the journalists are to do those deeper pieces. Uh, and there's some pretty good evidence, uh, and it's getting stronger because of the tendency on the internet for niche audiences, that the pieces uh, that draw the largest audiences, the pieces that are most likely to be passed along from one, that go viral, be passed along from one person to the next, the pieces that are likely to be evergreen, in other words, pieces that still would be drawing traffic two, three, four months after they were written, are those deeper, longer, better informed pieces. Those are the ones that seem to have legs. Uh, but that's very incomplete information uh, on the market viability of the kind of journalism I'm talking about. But I think the old style of journalism uh, has some market viability issues it needs to address. Yeah. You, you have just hinted a little bit about business models. We, we have a question from Hang who sends us or the question from Paris. Um, and would like to know uh, how do you see the business models uh, evolve uh, according to the ideas that, that you explore in your latest book? Well, I think it's going to take some number of different directions. My, you know, what's happened in the United States is that the traditional media has been losing audience. Um, and I think they're going to continue to lose audience. Uh, but I think there's some consolidation, a slowing of that process taking place now. So that in some ways we've got different markets at work here. Uh, one market that's growing in the United States, it's starting to grow more slowly than it was for a period of time, is the audience for partisan news. Uh, 
and we've not had that tradition in roughly a century in the United States. It was the 19th century tradition in the U.S., but not the 20th century tradition of journalism. Uh, and then well, we've got the traditional media. Uh, and what we're seeing in, with the traditional media, uh, counter to many of the people who said when the Internet came along that we're going to have a thousand flowers bloom, we're going to have all of these outlets, we're going to have this robust information system. Uh, what we're seeing now is some of the consolidation, some of the concentration uh, that was taking place uh, uh, in the old media. And we've seen enormous concentration in the old media uh, of ownership. We're beginning to see that happening on the, on the web. And the reason we're seeing that happening on the web is that brand is very important on the web. So if you think about the American market, for example, and you live in Topeka, Kansas, well, you've got your local newspaper. But if you want print news, who else might you think about? Well, you might think about the New York Times. Uh, so in some ways, the local paper competes with the New York Times. If you're the New York Times and your audience, do they ever think about the Topeka newspaper? I doubt it. Uh, so in some ways, brand matters. And so we're seeing a concentration of audience around those brands. The money has not quite kept up with that movement of audience. Uh, we still haven't quite figured out how to monetize for a really solid business model, uh, online uh, news consumption. But that's coming, and I think that will be there. And then we'll have a number of these news outlets, like the New York, like nytimes.com, that will have the revenues they need to do really solid, substantial, ongoing reporting. Of course, the New York Times does it already. Uh, uh, because it has a different kind of tradition, it has a much bigger newsroom. But I think we'll probably see six, eight, ten of these fairly substantial news outlets uh, ten years from now on the Internet, really competing, and competing over the quality of their journalism. Thank you. Um, I think we can move on to uh, a question related to the issue that Boston Global Forum will focus on next year, namely the the role that social media can play uh, to create a better, safer, more peaceful world. And we have a question from one of our collaborators who, who couldn't uh, be with us tonight. And he's he's wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, the emerging role of, I mean emerging, it's already a pretty established role that social media plays in, in the news cycle, and, and how that fits in into the knowledge-based news that you advocate for. Well, I think social media at this point are overrated in terms of what they mean for public information. Uh, we've got a lot of data that uh, indicate that um, much less news traffics are through social media than, than the uh, uh, proponents of, of that as a news source uh, would have us believe, that uh, uh, less than 1% of the social media traffic has anything to do with news and current affairs. Uh, if you look at the internet generally, uh, you know, visits to, to news sites uh, are a very tiny pr proportion, at least in terms of what, uh, what we might think. It's, it's maybe 3% of, of visits are to news sites. So, you know, I think, I think the social media are going to be an important part of this process. Uh, to me, the social media are much more important in getting people engaged uh, in public affairs, uh, getting them energized, getting them mobilized. Uh, the social media do that much better than the traditional media. Uh, what they're less good at uh, is informing people uh, about the events of the day. Uh, that's the traditional strength of the, uh, of the traditional media. Uh, the average person isn't equipped to do that. Uh, you know, if there's a knowledge deficiency among professional journalists, I can't tell you, I can't even begin to think about how deep that knowledge deficiency is among the average person who might go uh, and use Twitter or Facebook to try to tell someone else about what the world looks like. So, you know, I, I do think there's a place for the professional, but I also think there's a place for the amateur, but I think they play somewhat different roles in our information system. So. How, how do you see us as Boston Global Forum then with uh, our focus for next year on, on the issue of social media? Sort of, do you, do you advocate for a model where we uh, look at social media as a tool to build a movement, but then we need to have a substantial background that, that has that sort of skeleton to, to uh, withstand uh, 
and to hold uh, the ideas together that we're trying to advocate for? Or uh, are you saying that that social media on its own, uh, it doesn't amount to much? No, I'm not saying that, that social media on their own don't amount to much. Um, you know, I think uh, social media are very good at building community. Uh, and I think that's the goal of, of Boston Global Forum, is to, to build these communities around these issues. Are we fixed? Yeah, yes, okay. <laughs> you know, to build, to build communities around these issues, to, uh, to attract like-minded people into discussions, deliberation on important subjects like social media, uh, like the fate of garment, third world garment workers and the like. Uh, you know, I think that's different uh, than day-to-day -day journalism. Um, and uh, I've been talking and almost all of my remarks have been about day-to-day -day journalism and where I see the weaknesses. And as far as social media are concerned, I don't really see themselves, see them as a substitute uh, for the news organization. But that doesn't mean that they don't have important roles to play. And there are roles that they're much better at. Uh, you know, the traditional news media is, it, you know, that's mainly a one-way communication process. Uh, they're not all that good at building community. And they're certainly not very good at connecting people with one another. The sure social media do that very well. So, you know, I think if we think more broadly about uh, these different outlets, uh, these different kind of media, then I, can, I think we can see where they can make different contributions to democracy and to commit together, uh, each in their own way, can strengthen uh, uh, democratic life. Yeah. So if, if you were to, to give uh, two or three concrete uh, ideas uh, or, or suggestions for, for social media to, to play that role, what, what would they be? <coughs> You know, one is one is simply to get people talking to each other. Um, you know, there's a book of a colleague of mine, um, Bob Putnam wrote, called um, "Bowling Alone," uh, <clears throat> and it's basically about how we become more and more uh, ourselves and more centered on ourselves. Uh, you know, and it started in some ways. It started with television. Uh, you know, television took people off the streets and into their homes uh, and put them in front of their television sets in a very passive kind of way. Um, and the computer can do the same thing. Computer games can do that. Uh, but these technologies can also be ways of connecting us. Uh, and that's the beauty of, uh, of the Internet. Uh, sure, uh, it's a way to spend a lot of time alone, uh, sitting down, you know, looking at a screen. But it also increases our capacity to reach out to others. So I think one of the most important things about the social media is its social element, uh, the fact that it connects us. Uh, another thing that the social media can do, uh, better than others, uh, is really to get us activated. Um, because we end up, when we get connected on, on the social media, uh, and there are opportunities that present themselves, they can com be communicated quickly. Uh, you can see others are engaging in it. You don't feel that, I, well, I'm kind of alone in this and I'm not sure what my contribution means. When you see lots of other people doing it, you know, with uh, you know, crowdfunding, for example, and you see the, the amount getting more and more, or if you're in an election campaign and you see the, uh, the kind of the range of volunteer activities almost just taking off uh, exponentially, you know, that sends a strong signal about what you can do with the social media. So I think there are lots of uh, places where social media can strengthen uh, democracy, but it's mostly in community building. It's mostly in getting people involved. It's getting mostly in terms of getting people together. Thank you. Yeah, we're killing your voice here. Uh, I guess we can have room for, for one last question, uh, which... Uh, comes uh, also from another collaborator of ours who would like to know uh, what are your uh, next ideas to for research and books uh, what are what what do you have in mind to focus your attention on next well that's <clears throat> that's a good question because I, I'm up in the air a little bit about what uh, what might be next I have uh, I have two or three ideas let me just just run two of them by you um, one of the things, and this may, and these two are related. One of the things that um, 
troubles me about uh, the governing situation currently in the United States is the difficulty of getting people to work together. Um, and that's been more a problem uh, among our political leaders than among our citizens, but it's happening on both levels. Uh, and uh, Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., the, uh, the great American historian, wrote a book uh, in the middle of the 20th century called The Vital Center. Uh, and I think to some degree that's the part uh, of American politics that's, uh, that's been weakened and that we miss. Uh, so I'm, uh, one of the books I'm thinking about is, what do we need to do uh, to restore the center, uh, to make the center stronger against all of these uh, centrifugal kind of forces uh, around polarization that are taking place? Uh, and then a second book, uh, kind of on the same subject, but more kind of directly within uh, my personal kind of tradition, writing about the media, is to look at the media's role in, in party polarization. Uh, I Again, I think one of the most important challenges we face in the United States is this polarization between the two parties, the distance, that the growing distance between the two, uh, and the deadlock uh, that we see in Washington as a result, and some of the hostilities that we see at the level of citizens because people are in such radical disagreement uh, on what uh, government ought to do and what direction we ought to take on, on particular issues. Uh, and I think the media uh, are a contributor uh, to that problem. So I'd like to look at it more carefully to study it in a way where you could think about, okay, here are the things that you're doing deliberately and you can't do anything about those. We certainly have media outlets that are deliberately fueling the polarization. But I think there are practices that are taking place in the media that indirectly, uh, unwittingly, are also fueling that polarization. Uh, but to make that argument convincingly, you've got to demonstrate it. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me on Boston Global Forum. No, no. And, uh, yes, thank you so much, Professor Tom Peterson. Yeah, that, uh, this is the first time, first talk, first uh, program of uh, Meet Boston Global Forum Leaders series. Uh, and now uh, exciting, yeah, honor for December 12th, first day of Boston Global Forum. You oh, Tuan, you, you, you are my great friend, <laughs> and I'm glad you're sitting beside me for this first interview. So uh, it couldn't be a better organization, and it couldn't be uh, sitting next to uh, a better friend. So yes. thank you. Yeah. And thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for your attend and uh, listen and see us today and uh, we hope I have chance to serve and to meet you in next programs and uh, next series in from uh, January 2014. Thank you so much. Bye.